right, hi everybody. I was just wanting to get those four things on the screen when we started. So um, we are continuing this Let's Go Bible study. We talked about uh, the first step, love, um, looking at Jesus' love for us, our desire to, to share the good news with others. And now uh, we just began last time, we did the first half of um, the first lesson, the second part, the listen, talking about listening. Um, and Professor Poston had gone through and talked about the, the four uh, pieces of ethical dialogue. Um, we'll start with prayer, and then we'll kind of talk through what we had like 30 seconds at the end of last time, where it said give 10 minutes. We'll, we'll start with that um, this time. So let's pray. Lord God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be your witnesses to others. Help us to learn to listen well so that we can understand where people are coming from and, and have opportunities to connect them with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So he had gone through uh, confirmation. Um, so the, the uh, I hear you. The empathy, I, I feel you. I, I understand where you're coming from or why you would you would say this. Presentness, uh, I'm, I'm here in your life. I'm uh, uh, not just trying to get to the next thing, but, but you matter, this moment matters. And supportive climate, um, I'm trying to remember how he defined that one. Uh, the, you know, it, when, when someone disagrees with us, it's really easy to judge. So well, you're wrong, I'm right, and I know you're wrong because I'm right, so um, that's it. Uh, if, if that's where we're at, it's hard, to, it's hard to have a good conversation. It's hard to be truly listening. So the question that he had asked, which of the qualities of ethical dialogue challenge you most when you're in a strong disagreement? Let's just kind of talk through that as a group here. Which of those four challenge you most? Anyone want to share? Anyone willing to share? It's more fun than we talk. I think empathy can be really hard if things are going really well in your life to bring yourself to a, a bad place, bad place, so to say, uh, meeting them with their emotions. Okay. It can be a struggle. Or if things are going really awfully in your life, to say you're really complaining about that uh, can be just as yeah. So empathy is definitely a, a tough one. Um, anyone read John Krakauer, that author, Under the Banner of Heaven, Into Thin Air, Into the Wild? Into the Wild. Yeah. So he his his books um, take something that sounds crazy. Like why would anyone do that? And through telling the story, hey, come on in. Through telling the story, um, he, uh, uh, by the end, you understand why someone would do that. So one of them, Into Thin Air, the, he, he went on an Everest expedition where a whole bunch of people died. And just to try to understand why would someone do this? Why would you push? Why would, you know? Um, and by the end, you're like, oh, okay, now I see. The one that really blew my mind was uh, Under the Banner of Heaven about there were a couple of fundamentalist Mormons who murdered their whole family in Utah, I don't know, 25 years ago, something like that. And they said, well, God told them to. And you say, that is crazy. Uh, that is absolutely crazy. Uh, but then, you, you know, he kind of goes through and gives a lot of the history of Mormonism and how some of the decisions are made and how people were thinking and what the whole culture was like. And you say, oh, I can see how that happened. You know, just someone got a, a turn off and uh, um, yeah, some crazy stuff happens. But, but that reading those kind of helped me with uh, realizing that even, even the person that you look at and say, wow, is this either messed up or is this, you are completely wrong um, to, to want to figure out how did you get there? How did that happen? Um, and to realize that only by the grace of God go I, the fact that I know my Savior, praise God for that. Um, I could have very easily been right where that person is. So yeah, that empathy is 
is a powerful one. Anyone else? Any of the other ones jump out at you? No, every empathy was the toughest. All right, we'll go with that. Good. Okay, so he had he had discussed the uh, um, ethical dialogue. Uh, if you remember, in his opening part, he had talked about some of the um, the ways that Jesus uh, had people willing to talk to him, that he was a good listener, right? And uh, whether that was uh, um, talking to Martha after Lazarus's death, uh, the woman who told him everything, you know, he, he used several of those examples. So th those kind of come in as background to what we're going to watch here. So we're going to start at 839, Let's see if I can find it. Which I had it there and the timer just didn't change. And after the discussion, we start the video. <laughs> All right, and then after this, we're going to talk about what always be prepared what these things to, give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. That's 1 Peter 3, verse 15. The Apostle Peter is not assuming that people will be constantly filling up hopeful thoughts because they admire us and want the good things that we apparently have. Certainly that can happen. And we praise God when doors like that open for us. Further, many people who still live outside of Jesus can yet be remarkably kind and polite to us. They are not difficult to listen to or talk with at all. In context, however, Peter knows that Christians in this hostile world will be persecuted as we share in the disgrace of Christ. Given the times we are living in, we will encounter people who think we are ridiculous. They think we are what's wrong with the world. Gentleness and respect? When you do take the words in context, they are deceptively simple but truly radical ideals. People may come at us with arrogance, or condescension, and we are called to respond to something else. Imagine how these two qualities might actually sound when we as the church are colliding as the church must with the skeptical world. Pause the video and share with each other what gentleness might sound like when talking to a skeptical unbeliever. Then share what respect might sound like. Allow up to three minutes for each. And after the discussion, please continue the video. Okay, so let's do that in groups. U6 will be one group, and U6 will be another group. Um, what's that? So everybody on that side of the room is one group. Um, so take a couple of minutes, talk about what gentleness might sound like when talking to a skeptical unbeliever, talk about what respect might sound like when talking to a skeptical uh, unbeliever, and the reporter is going to be the person who flossed the longest time ago, who most recently flossed the longest time ago. So for me, it would be last week, Monday, when I ate an orange and had some stuff in my teeth. Uh, some of you floss every day. Good for you. Uh, true confessions, I don't, and I should. My dentist tells me I should. Anyway, so that's who's going to be the reporter, uh, whoever flossed the longest ago. Um, so do we want to, uh, with two more in here, should we do two groups on this side? So you guys and then you guys. So Brenda, James, Leilani, and David. And Deborah, do you want to jump in with, with them? They might. Um... And Peter, you're your own group. You can report. Yeah. 
I'm excited to hear what this <laughs> delinquent foster is going to tell me. Make sure you're working on the second question too. What respect might sound like if you haven't gotten to that, it's time to talk about that. <laughs> All right, let's see what we came up with. The, the pen is dropping over here, so that means that group must be done. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna save this group. I'm gonna save this group for last. So so let's start in the back there. <laughs> All right, so who, who's our reporter in that back group? We didn't get that far. Oh, okay. Who wants to report? Uh, I can do it. All right. So what do you guys talk about? What does gentleness, what does respect sound like? Um, so we were kind of talking um, that they kind of go together a little bit. Um, with gentleness, sometimes it can be the tone about how you say something and you okay. don't need me with the love of Christ and, you know, gospel and not always leading with the law. Like, you know, it's hard to be gentle if you're going around telling anybody they're going to go to hell okay. all the time, right? So um, doing something like that and then respect is, you know, um, where I didn't make a comment about, you know, like, why do you believe what it is that you believe? Or you don't, you don't say you don't believe in God. Why is that? You know, respect or, you know, try and find out where they're coming from so that then you can respond with the gospel okay. or God's word to them and um, you know, not be like you're an idiot. Okay. 
<laughs> Good advice. <laughs> Excellent. How about you guys? Who's who's reporter? Um, we, we also kind of wrote some respective gentleness together. The analogy of two sports fans really brawling in the stand, like how can that happen? And it's just about the passion I have. We want to have that passion for the gospel, but with the board, so much you love to be able to listen to what they say. And we mentioned tones, and okay. it's not always what you say, but how you say it, and respecting where that person is coming from. Okay. Um, what they live throughout their life. All right. Yeah, their story might be very different than mine. And, and how did, yeah, good. Okay, I'm excited to hear the pen drop statement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we, we talked a lot about kind of like the purity aspect of it is, you know, if you're truly believing, I don't want to use the word selfish, but we, we, we kind of put an example in there too. It's like when somebody's trying to sell you something and okay. they, they don't, uh, they're not really into it, but if you truly believe what it is you're trying to say, okay. then people can fixate on that and they can relate to that because they, they see how passionate you are about something, then it's going to reflect on them. So we use okay. We said um for the first question was being a true believer, compassion and purity. Okay. Um, the second question we put uh we put reflection and uh being genuine. Okay. Yeah it's it's uh very disrespectful to someone to uh go through the motions, right? I got up here and tell you about it so here's the information. But that uh yeah being genuine this is this matters. Anything to add, Peter? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I was thinking too that we we differentiate sometimes. Uh, let me see. There are a lot of things we group under the word respect, and sometimes okay. when we say respect, we mean defer to authority, like respect your respect your elders or something. Mm -hmm. But the a lot of what we're talking about here is acknowledging our shared humanity maybe you can look at it as we're all made in the image of god you know that we we are all people we are all sinners and that when we are respecting others it is not endorsement okay good yeah there's a difference between um being empathic and listening and respecting and being gentle there's a difference between that and agreeing with false statements or or uh, um, sinful actions. Good, good. All right, let's go back to the video. We got a three minute segment here. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. You may be familiar with this principle that makes Stephen Covey's famous list of the seven habits of highly effective people. I find it incredibly useful. Let's say someone is not a Christian and doesn't want to be. If we ask them for their reasons, they may say only a little, or they may have quite a lot to say, but are they being transparent with us? How much are they holding back? Why? The idea of seek first to understand is that we want to be able to explain that person's point of view as well as they can explain it themselves. This can take time and it can take work as we try to draw out their actual reasons. How do they think about Christian truth? What have they experienced? What have they been exposed to that they find convincing? What does it mean to them? How does it feel? Where are they really coming from? Have they ever told all this to anyone before? I want to be able to explain it to them as well as they can explain it themselves. That may sound unrealistic. I can't be in someone else's skin, but I'm really trying to describe an ideal. <coughs> what I'm saying is simply that I'm going to try. I mean, really try. I have so often had to realize, sometimes quite painfully, that my words were weak when I spoke from a shallow understanding of the person in front of me, or from a superficial grasp of a situation that confronted me. I worked hard to develop an instinct to ask, hmm, I wonder if there's more to this story. I bet there is. 
For example, if countless people reject the very idea of God because of the doctrine of hell or of divine justice, I need to know whether this is a rational problem because of some bit of philosophy they claim to, or a broken heart over someone who has died in unbelief. We want to develop an intuition about how people only slowly unfold their true selves and what things are really about for them. Maybe a person's life has been tragically difficult in a way that makes the love of God an incredibly difficult idea to grasp. I need to know that. And it isn't something someone just puts out there in the first five minutes of a casual conversation. We want to distinguish ourselves as people who will go further than most people would ever think you would ever need to in simply saying to ourselves, for goodness sake, I'm going to understand this. As well as I can, I am going to understand this. Please pause the video and turn to the section entitled Being on the Other End in your study guide. All right, so this one is going to be fun. Um, we'll go back to the groups and uh, your opportunity to deeply, deeply reflect on or explore with other people the experiences you have had of being listened to well and on the people you've known who do it supremely well. So um, the person who has flossed most recently uh, is going to be the reporter this time. And, uh, um, and as, as the discussion is going, there's six questions to, to talk about. So maybe not everybody will, will be able to um, share someone, but, but uh, two or three of you uh, describe, answer those six questions about someone that comes to mind. And maybe for some of you in the same family, you're thinking, oh, I, there's one person that we all know and you can work together um, on, on that. But, uh, but yeah, go through those questions, you know, describe that listener, um, what do they actually do? You know, what uh, he's got some keys in there, recall nonverbal communication, the look on the face, the eye contact, et cetera. What do they say? Uh, how, how do they, when it's their turn to talk, uh, how do they do that? And you've got all those questions to help you discuss it. So you have uh, seven minutes. So that's about, if three people go, that's two minutes a piece. If two people go, it's three and a half a piece. So um, ready, set, go. I think what she did really well, she had a lot of intentional silence, like she took a while to be on the things.
We're talking about listening. I'm hearing a lot of talking. That's good. So 30 seconds, 30 seconds left. You guys are good, doing a good job of listening to each other. Um, so we'll start with this group this time. What uh, this? What do you come up with for describing your uh, your best listener? Uh, 
Okay. And it's obvious you know, listening to genuine, genuine care. Okay. Um, listening to what you have, you know, have to say. Awesome. Any other groups have something to add to that? Just take your answer. What what did your best listeners do? Who's my reporter here? Anything? The recent cluster? Um, Picker? That's me. <laughs> um, one of the things that good listeners do is they have intentional silence. Sometimes we are quick to <laughs> react and someone's not quite done pouring out how they feel. I mean, they just need a little silence to, oh, I thought of another thing that I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Another thing, um, utilizing intentional silence is a, a good skill in listeners. Okay. Good my reporter back here. Anything to add on that first one? Uh, here it is. <laughs> making, making the environment uh, a comfortable environment that allows you to share. Okay. Awesome. Number two, what do they say? Um, how did you describe that? We'll work our way backwards around. So Deborah, you want to start us off? What, what kind of things did they say? Uh, sometimes they're not saying something. Okay. They have that open communication look. It's like, hey, okay, I'm listening to the group. It's like, you know, talking. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You know, okay. So it gives you that comfort to say, oh, they're listening because they're like, oh, focus on me and they're, you know, that face is open. Okay. Awesome. Just willingness to bring up the tough conversation, uh, to say something in the first place, to, to ask them, you know, is someone feeling sad or, or looking down mm -hmm. or just remembering something how that they're going through. Just uh, the initial starting point of the conversation is very important to getting someone to open up. Okay. They're not working on their technology while, while you're talking, exactly. that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, that's good. What'd you say? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, this is sort of like number two sort of reflects back to number one. Um, I just like what I what I use an example of like uh, uh the best the best listener is or like how do they say it or something like that. Um I would say I, I use an example of the friend group that I had at school like it's like it's the best listeners is like or like how how they just like look at you and stuff like it's just it's basically like if they're so like if you are if if you like take time to listen to what they're saying and stuff um and like how you turn them back like if you like if if you listen like if they listen to you when you're if they listen to you when you're trying to speak about problems and you know um how you're feeling and feeling and stuff and then it's sort of like it works both ways. Like okay. if if you give them time to speak and um if you pay attention to what they're doing and then and respond back in the kindest way possible and stuff, and like pay attention to respond this. Then they do the same to, okay. to you and stuff. It's so, good. It's so good, good. Excellent. Peter, jump in if you've got anything to add on, on either of these. Okay. Uh, what are the effects people achieve who, pre who present themselves and communicate in these ways? What can they accomplish in these ways that otherwise they cannot? Anyone have anything for that one? Dora? When you do have this, you tend to get more of a response from the person when you put these uh, actions into play. Okay. Because it's not like, you know, the person will feel like, oh, you're not listening to me, so I'm not, I'm not going to share it. Right. Good. What do they do to you? Who do you become when you're around them? You better listen to yourself. I think so, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a, 
huge modeling thing. And Caleb, that's the point you were making too. When when they give you time to talk, you're 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 going to want to hear what they have to say too. Good. How do you feel about these people? You trust them. Okay. Yeah. Why is true listening so rare? What gets in the way? What did you guys talk about on that? There's a bunch of people that assume. assume. Okay. Yeah, assumptions definitely. You know, I, I, I see this person and I think you're, you're like this and, and not taking the time. And, you know, I guess that kind of goes back to pride, right? I know better than you who you are. Um, because this was the impression that, that you gave me instead of that humility of saying, I, I want to find out. You know, I, I liked the, the question he kept coming back to, you know, I, I want to understand this. Uh, help me understand this. Uh, good. Anything else on that one, on six? I think sometimes you tend to talk about yourself. Those, we tend okay. to want to talk about ourselves. We know ourselves the best. Yeah. So if somebody says something and you're going to relate a story that happened to you or something, not that that's bad, like those can be good, those experiences, I think, yeah. but all of a sudden you're talking about you as opposed to the person that you're with or whatever. And, and like, it's just natural. We know ourselves the best. So, yeah. Or at least we think we did it. Yeah, and, and isn't there that preconceived notion that when I'm talking, that means I'm important and I like feeling important because if I'm saying the things, then it, you know, and, and so I always have to find something to say as opposed to having the humility to say, I want to learn something and, and listen. Yeah, that's a good point, Melissa. Um, on listening, sometimes you can get put into an uncomfortable situation and it makes it harder to figure out, you know, with responding and that you're listening and your, it, it's your perception. Okay. And, you know, that can, you know, that can make it a more hard listener. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ready? I'm not a good listener. I'm, I'm just going to let everybody think it. Like, I'm not a good listener. Um, but part of mine is, I was going to use an example of my stepdaughter. It can take her 25 minutes to tell you something that I would tell you in two. So I will finish whatever it is. Because I'm like, let's go here. Let's yeah. get going. Because I'm trying to. I'm just so used to going so much faster, and that's not good listening, right? Like you just gotta go through the 25. Are minutes. you done yet, Brenda? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Sorry. <laughs> no, but no, yeah, that's I, it. Like, exactly. It, so, like, sometimes I think, you know, whether it's life or, you know, kind of like people were saying, you know, a good listener focuses and has attention. Yeah. You know, if you're trying to jump in or help them finish explaining what it is or whatever it is, that's not good listening. Yeah, so much of it is patience, um, which is what makes listening hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. Anything else on that? We've got 38 seconds left of this video. Jesus and his apostles knew the importance of listening carefully to others. Thanks to Professor Paustian, we now have some things to think about so that we can become better listeners. Next time. We will learn how we can overcome our fear of not knowing what to say after we have listened carefully to someone. See you then. And here he is. It's Welcome next time. back and let's go. <laughs> Last time we learned from Jesus and his apostles why it is so important that we listen to others. And we learn some techniques to help us listen more carefully. Next, we are going to learn how we can overcome our fear of knowing what to say after we have listened carefully to someone. And you might be surprised to find out that it actually involves more listening. Let's find out more. There is something incredibly freeing when you learn to say, I'm going to understand this person as well as I can, however long it takes. I cannot overstate the degree to which it changed how I experience high pressure situations when I simply seek first to understand. 
I'm thinking especially about the pressure of knowing what to say. You may feel that you cannot be involved in witnessing conversations until you have an encyclopedic grasp of every possible answer to every possible question. Maybe you worry about freezing up when something difficult or deeply personal comes up. That's what I mean by the pressure of knowing what to say. Seek first to understand, then and only then to be understood means setting that pressure completely aside. You don't even need to worry about that as you give yourself all the time you need to explore the other person's story or their skepticism about Jesus and what it's really all about for them. Maybe it's better to say that you postpone the pressure we often feel having to do with what am I going to say to such and such person with such and such issues. The application we take on instead for as long as seems useful is gaining a more complex view of the person before us. And we will do this rather than contradicting people at our first opportunity or immediately trying to form our response all the while they are trying to be heard. What does that actually sound like? Here's just one example that will serve to just introduce the idea of active listening that we will work with in the next lesson. I remember a conversation with a man who told me that the church is full of hypocrites. This was his reason for not giving Christians the time of day, and more importantly, for not giving Jesus a second thought. The church is full of hypocrites. The person who seeks first to understand will realize that there is more to this man than this objection. There's more to the story. Ask yourself what you might have said. Pause the video for a moment to give yourself that opportunity. What do you say to the person who says the church is full of hypocrites? So pause the video for a few minutes and discuss this question, then resume the video. All right. So uh, in your groups, take three minutes and make a list of as many responses as you can. How many different responses to the objection, the church is full of hypocrites. And then we're gonna have a contest and I have candy as the prize to see which group comes up with the most. And Peter, you're your own group. So try to win the candy. I'll throw it. <laughs> Ready, set, go. Yes. You're what? Thirty seconds left. And time's up. All right. So we're going to go around. Each group will give one answer. 
and we'll keep going until you don't have any answers left. And if someone else says your answer, you don't, it, it's, it's off the table. You, can only say, you can't like repeat what the other group said. So Peter, we're gonna start with you. Response to the church is full of hypocrites. Well, you're one to say that. Okay, here we go. We're all sinners. Okay, we're all sinners. Oh, oh, probably true. What? Probably true. Probably true. What are people doing that makes you say that? Okay, I'm going to ask, find out. Peter? Where else would they go? Okay. Uh, why do you feel that way? Why do you feel that way? All right. Oh, um, how do you know? Okay, you're not coming. How do you know? All right. <laughs> do you think I'm going to prefer? Okay. Are you crazy? <laughs> I guess that's a response. I skipped you, Peter. Go ahead. But make what do you mean by hypocrite? Okay, let's get a definition. Any more? Oh, when is the last time you've been to church? Okay. You're out. No one is perfect. No one's perfect. Okay. You got any more, Peter? We're not full yet. There's always space for you. Okay. <laughs> What is an example? Okay. You guys are up. Any? Uh, Jesus is our salvation, not man. Okay. Jesus is our salvation, not, not man. Peter? I'll stop. Okay. Let's <laughs> group back here. Oh, what church did you go to? Okay. So let's let's talk about some of this history that caused it. Um, what can I do to put you at ease? Okay. What, what, how can we help? No. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I'm not, you're wrong. I suppose that is a response. It didn't say how many good responses. It just said how many responses can you come up with? Uh, that is why we need the word. That's why we need the word. I'm not the liar. I'm not what? The liar. The liar? Okay. <laughs> you're right. You're right. You guys are going to keep going all day, aren't you? What's that? <laughs> You're finished? All right, all right. So there's six of you. So you guys get to figure out who gets what. Congratulations. All right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. All right. So a lot of responses. <laughs> so there's a lot of ways to take it i think we would agree that some of those wouldn't be ideal right um just the confrontational your own right kind of thing but uh, you had a lot of different ways to to ask the question help me understand that uh help me understand um oh, you're right we got an injury Okay. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So with those responses, finding ways to, to get a discussion going, help me understand what you mean by that word. Uh, why do you say that? What's the history? Some humility. Yeah. Um, we're sinners that need our salvation. Uh, and, and that's, we want to be real about that. Um, sorry that we've given you know that 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 you've received that impression that's um you know we we believe that we're sinners that that want to um that need god's forgiveness and, and and want to live according to that so good let's uh watch the next segment this will be our our last one so what did you come up with i actually hope what you would say is what do you mean by hypocrite he will answer you, perhaps by talking about Christians not living up to what they say they believe. And you may actually have several more opportunities to ask, and what do you mean by that? At a certain point, you may transition to another question that you can ask in different ways. For example, how have you come to think this way? Or how have you reached this conclusion? This is where their story may begin to slowly unfold right in front of you. 
As it turned out in the conversation I'm remembering, I thought the man and I had come to a good understanding of hypocrisy. I explained that Jesus himself agrees with the man and that Jesus is more bothered than he is by the bad fish among the good and by the weeds among the wheat, as Jesus put it. But we were still somehow not getting anywhere. As a reason to deny the truth of Christ, something wasn't making sense. That is, until I happened to stumble on an active listening skill called reflecting feeling. Just for a moment, I stopped dealing with his spoken objections and noticed the strong emotion on his face and in his voice. I said something like, Bill, I understand what you're saying and I'm agreeing with you, but you seem so angry. And he replied, you're blank, 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 right, I'm angry, and proceeded to tell me about the death of his father and the cruelty he felt he experienced at the hands of devout believers. The conversation didn't suddenly become easy, but we had at least begun to have the right conversation, and it was about something else entirely. What do you say about the charge of hypocrisy? How about, what do you mean by that? And why do you think that's true? Because I really want to know. Have you ever experienced a time when you asked someone what they meant or what they said, and then actually surprised you? Please pause the video and take a few minutes to share such an experience with the others in your group. All right, you heard him. Um, two minutes. Share an experience where you, where someone surprised you when, when you asked them what they meant by something and you, you figured out you were talking about something completely different altogether. I'm hearing a lot of thinking, so maybe why don't we share with the big group? Let's uh, let's share with the big group. Um, who who shared who shared a good one here? You can throw under your bus one of your table mates. Um, my, my mom. I mean, this is okay. Later, but we were walking around Hobby Lobby and Kylie saw Al that she liked, and my mom was like, They're evil, don't go near them. And I'm like, What? What do you mean they're evil? And she's like, They're evil. So, like, for five minutes, I kept asking her, Why are they evil? So mm -hmm. she Googles it and reads a Harry Potter quote. I'm like, Mom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, oh, poor lady. <laughs> you tell her to go to church or find a church because she won't listen to me right now. <laughs> okay. Did That's the back group have any any good examples? Not so much. Uh, she was telling us that she learned that girls and boys shirts button up differently. All right. From whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Learn something new. Okay, cool. 
I went to do a visit with someone who we hadn't had contact with yet. Um, just they were new to the area, so I dropped by their house and started a conversation. I'm from Biden Grace Lutheran Church. Um, they thought, oh, that, that's really cool. Yeah, I believe in God. I, I believe in the Bible. I believe in Jesus. It seemed to me like the conversation was going very, very well. And then they soon revealed to me, oh, but Jesus is just one of the many ways we can come to learn about God. And there's a universe, and I've got these crystals that I use, and uh, other means to know who God is. And so I thought we were really on the same page for a little bit, and then it turns out we were not on the same page. So yeah, important question. What do you mean when you say? You know, I, I think of you know conversations with... Uh, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, yeah, Jesus is my Savior. Oh, great, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. What do you mean by that? Uh, and the answer is, sadly, too often, not what we mean by that. Um, and yeah, so it's an important question. Next week, we'll dig in a little bit more to using that question um, and get some practice at it. We'll use the rest of class here to watch the Wells Connection from November. I'm behind, sorry. Uh, but we'll close with prayer and then I'll press play. Lord God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to learn to listen, help us to use the skill uh, that we might be able to have conversations, that we might be able to, to learn about the people with whom we're talking so that we can share with them the, the news that they need to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right. <laughs> And here you go. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. 100 new home missions in 10 years, starting in 2023. That was the plan proposed and approved at our Senate convention this past summer. It's an ambitious goal. But for the nearly 175 year history of our church body, starting home mission churches has always been at the core of what we do. Now in the 21st century, home mission planting has developed into a finely tuned process with support and guidance at every step. Recent seminary graduate pastor Tim Walsh and his wife Ruth are in training to restart a mission church in Long Island, New York. But they aren't alone. Today, Mission Counselor Reverend Mark Burkholz is briefing them on the many ways our Synod provides resources and connections for each home mission pastor. My role becomes explaining to the young pastor who all these sources of help are. Each one of them will be asked to it. It just makes me appreciate how ready, how willing Synod is to um, carry out this work, you know, that we're not just looking to sustain, we're not just looking to um, kind of plateau or stay where we are, but we understand that this, this gospel message is so important. In addition to this initial briefing, an experienced home mission pastor is assigned as a coach to provide one-on-one -on -one guidance for two full years. Plus, there is a representative from their district mission board assigned to help shepherd the home mission. It's exciting to know that there's a lot that we can do and that we get to do it as a family. We go out and meet new people, the wonderful people that are over in New York. Today, lay involvement is key to any home mission start. Lay members often begin working with their district mission board before the home missionary even arrives. The pastor is supported by Boots on the Ground to help bring the good news of Jesus to the community. Cultivating others that have never heard the gospel, haven't even maybe considered it, I think there is definitely a place to, to uh, you know, do some fishing. By the time we leave today, you'll feel comfortable and confident in going door to door. To help prepare teams of lay people involved in the home mission effort, our Synod partners with a program called Praise and Proclaim to provide personal evangelism training. The pastor just cannot come in and do it all by himself or all alone. 
you know, he needs that core group of people to not only help him with the work, but also be a source of encouragement. I believe that we are entering into an era where there's a dynamic change in evangelism. I think that for churches today, it's not just going out and inviting people to come to church, but I think it's becoming even more important for us to bring the church to the community. There's just a few key words that we really want to keep in mind, and you can you can be creative with that and go beyond that, but that's good. We need that. Many home missions today start when lay people at an established congregation see an opportunity for gospel outreach in a neighboring community. This ensures a core group is available to help the mission pastor with the effort. Good news in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. This example started as the daughter congregation of a larger church 15 miles away. To not only have really the official support of the whole church body behind you, but to have a specific congregation whose heart is very much into this new church getting started to be there as one more source of encouragement and really one more source of, of support. Now, seven years in, this mission congregation is ready to take the next step, making plans to move from this rented facility to its own church building. It's a long journey, but our synod provides guidance, support, and expertise at every step. While the goal of opening 100 missions in 10 years from 2023 to 2033 is challenging, with our church body providing various resources and actively supporting missionaries, we can work together to reach this goal. More importantly, we'll be working together to tell more people about the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we pray that God would bless this effort to his glory. Learn more about Wells Home Missions at wells.net forward slash omissions. Bye, Peter. Take care.